from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the Church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then, they accompanied him to the ship. It would be really helpful if you could keep your Bibles open at the passage that Liz has read to us in Acts 20. On March the 21st this year, I was scrolling through my emails while still sat in bed and came across one from my dad's care home sent at 7.39 that morning. It said that as of 2pm that day, the home would be closed to visitors because of the coronavirus outbreak. I made it in to see him before lunch and had to say goodbye to him that day with no idea when I may next be able to see him. It was really hard and it's now been two months since I have seen him with no real change on the horizon. What painful goodbyes have you had in your life? It might be painful because you just want to be with that person, like the goodbyes Paul and I used to have on Bath Station when we were going out. It might be painful because you know that before you see that person again, you have to cope with something big happening in your life. I remember the time that, heavily pregnant, I saw my mum and dad off, knowing that I would not see them again until Tom had been born. I felt as if a long journey lay ahead of me. 
It may be that you've known the painful goodbye that happens because you know that someone you love is dying and you genuinely don't know if you will ever see them alive again. Sadly, many people have experienced this in the last few weeks as people have not been able to be with their loved ones in their last days. Not being able to say a proper goodbye has added to the pain of loss and bereavement. In our reading today, the Apostle Paul says goodbye to those to whom he has been a friend and mentor in the Christian faith. There are tears as he has said that they would never see his face again. It's a painful goodbye. Paul had spent the best part of three years with the Ephesian church, the longest he spent anywhere, and you can read about it in chapter 19. God greatly uses him there to build the church, but as time goes on, Paul leaves to go to Jerusalem via Macedonia and Greece. His ultimate plan is to get to Jerusalem, Rome, and then on to Spain. But a plot against him means that he ends up going back the way he had come, and so he finds himself near Ephesus again as he comes down the coast, island by island, until he reaches Miletus on the mainland of what is modern-day Turkey, about 30 miles south of Ephesus. He's in a hurry as he wants to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost, so he decides not to go into Ephesus itself, which would have been a detour, and instead he invites the elders of the church in Ephesus to come and meet him in Miletus. Today is the final sermon in our short series on our fellowship, as we have thought about what it means to build our fellowship, rooted as it is in our relationship with God first and foremost. And we looked last week at some of the nuts and bolts of what fellowship means as we learn, love and worship together. Today, with the help of this passage, we're thinking about the care of our fellowship. And the first thing we learn is that we care for our fellowship by teaching our fellowship. To build up the fellowship in Ephesus, Paul has had a speaking ministry. We find this five times in this passage. Words such as preach, declare, testify, proclaim. It hasn't been easy for Paul. In verse 18, he comments that he served the Lord among them with tears and with severe testing due to opposition. But he remained true to the message that he had and sought to equip the church with the full picture. To help the Ephesians, he says in verse 20, to proclaim the whole will of God in verse 27 and to warn them where necessary in verse 31. He has taught the Ephesians all that they need to know, a message of turning to God in repentance and having faith in our Lord Jesus, verse 21. Paul's whole life is caught up in the aim of finishing the race, whatever hardships may meet him. He wants to complete the task Jesus has given him, to be a witness of the good news of God's wonderful grace. For Paul himself knows what it is to be forgiven. He has gone from persecuting the church and supervising the killing of Christians to being an outspoken follower of Jesus, ready to suffer for his faith in him. But he's also aware that God has a purpose for humanity as a whole and that the grace that he has experienced is on offer to all. He has been faithful to the good news of God's grace, of God's love for us that he sent his son Jesus into the world that we might have forgiveness and life. There is nothing we can do to earn it or deserve it. It doesn't depend on us. That is the good news. But what we do have to do is make a decision to turn to God, to be sorry for the ways in which we have missed the mark, the Bible's word for that is sin, and to place our faith in Jesus. It may be that you don't really know St Nick's but are listening in, and perhaps you've heard that for the first time. We'd love to hear from you if you would like to know more. That is the message Paul has, and it is our same message today. Paul has held on to that message and not wavered from it. And we can see in verses 20 to 21 that he had taken that message all around Ephesus, teaching Christians, but also Jews and Greeks who have yet to turn to God through Jesus. He has built up the Ephesian fellowship through his teaching and through seeking to bring others into that fellowship. He has done that publicly in the synagogue until he was met with disbelief. 
then at a local lecture hall, but also privately in homes, in conversations, over meals, day and night. He was tireless. And as one commentator put it, he is wanting to share all possible truths with all possible people in all possible ways. Paul has not flinched from bringing the truth to people, even if that is difficult to accept. So he is keen to warn of false teaching, truth that is distorted by wolves who would come in or even be part of the church and seek to draw people away. Distortion of the truth can be subtle and we must be on our guard. We are to care for and protect our fellowship through sound teaching and through actively speaking out when something seems wrong or contrary to scripture. So here at St Nick's we care for our fellowship in making sure that our spoken word remains true to scripture as we long to always be a church where the Bible is central to what we believe about God and how we live for God, as our vision document says. We must hold fast to the good news of God's grace and declare to those around us that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Our culture might say that sin is an outdated concept, that no one is too bad really, apart from the extreme exceptions. It might be said that because God is a God of love, surely everyone is saved in the end. We must hold fast to the truth, lest at best we mislead people, and at worst we rob them of the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus and respond to it, and we will be held accountable. How can we share all possible truth with all possible people in all possible ways? It's not just in sermons, it's in small group Bible studies, our children, young people's work, through our online presence, something we've become so much more aware of at this time, through Alpha, through our own individual conversations with neighbours or friends and family, and as we raise our children. Pray for opportunities, equip yourself with truth, make sure you tap into reliable resources for your own Bible study, Challenge those who preach about their sermons. Question things that you're not sure about. We care for our fellowship, as Paul did, by teaching our fellowship. And we do that in different ways together. Secondly, we care for our fellowship by leading our fellowship. Paul is speaking to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. They are called elders, overseers and shepherds in this passage. There are a number of them and it gives the idea of team. John Stott makes the point that there is nothing biblical about a one-man band or for a structure with a single leader perched at the top of a pyramid. While there would have been a number of house churches in Ephesus, it is not clear that each of the elders was in charge of one house church. It is more likely that this was a team with some having the oversight of the house churches, while others with particular gifts also shared in looking after the flock. Here at St Nick's, leadership is expressed in different ways. There is a clergy team, a staff team, a PCC, leaders of small groups and pastoral care, and other areas where people with particular gifts take a lead. I love the picture of shepherds and sheep. Sheep are animals who are prone to wander, who are stubborn, who will follow their fellow sheep even to destruction. In 2005 in Turkey, one sheep walked off a cliff and 1,500 followed it. Thankfully, about a thousand survived as they had a soft landing. Shepherd is another word for pastor, who has the key duty of taking care of the flock. Yet it's interesting to note that Paul reminds the elders that they may be the shepherds of the church, but they must keep watch over themselves as well as the flock. They are sheep too. In Psalm 23, David says that the Lord is my shepherd. David the king, the leader of Israel, knew his own need for a shepherd. No church leader in whatever capacity is immune from wandering like a sheep. 
and we must keep watch over ourselves. It is easy to use the busyness of life and the needs of the flock as a reason or an excuse for not taking care of your own spiritual life. Will and I are simply sheep in need of a shepherd. And if we neglect to follow Jesus ourselves, we will not be safe leaders to lead St Nick's alongside you all. We cannot tend to others' needs if we neglect our own and do not allow them to be tended to. The first priority of every Christian leader is not to be a leader, but to be a follower of Jesus. And I have to remind myself of that again and again. Paul's model of leadership seems to be a servant model expressed in humility and tirelessly keeping going for their good, with a sense of urgency and even tears. He is clear that it's not just been about what he has said, but also in the model of his life. In verse 33 onwards, how he has cared for them and in how he has lived his own life, determined to support himself, working hard, helping those who are weak, giving rather than receiving. Paul has cared for the fellowship in leading them well, both in word and deed. All those in leadership have that responsibility as they watch over the flock that they are called to shepherd. Please pray for those in leadership at St Nick's in the different areas of our life together, particularly as we lead under lockdown and as we think about how we emerge from that lockdown and build our fellowship in a new season. So we care for our fellowship in the teaching and the leading of our fellowship. And we care for our fellowship by caring for our fellowship. That sounds a bit obvious, but I wonder how you feel about St Nick's and our life together. Maybe you feel you belong, you've experienced a depth in relationships that the word fellowship suggests. And so this time of separation has been difficult for you. Perhaps there are others among us who feel indifferent towards St Nick's, a bit take it or leave it, and you're not so bothered by the present restrictions. When I moved to Newbury to be curate here nearly four years ago, it didn't take long before I started to feel really sad at the thought that I would have to leave St Nick's at the end of the curacy, which is by very nature temporary. So it's been amazing that it's been possible to stay. I was thinking of that as I looked at this passage as it gives me a small glimpse of how Paul felt towards the Ephesians. We see Paul in a different light here. Usually he is outspoken and eager to argue on behalf of the gospel, but here he is quiet and reflective. In this passage, we pick up on his love for the Ephesian fellowship, his passion that has made him work hard for them day and night, making sure that he equips them with both the truth of the gospel and how it should be lived out. He gave all he could and felt so deeply that he cried over them. And that in turn is a reflection of how deeply God felt about that church and how deeply God feels about St Nick's. For Paul reminds them in verse 28 that it is God's church, not Paul's, not the Ephesian elders, not Will's or Joy's church, but God's church. It is precious. The sheep are precious. Why? Because they have been bought with his own blood, each one of them. God gave his son, a shepherd who would lay down his life, his sheep. His blood has bought them, paid the price. And in order for the flock to be cared for, the Holy Spirit has appointed shepherds in the church. To care for our fellowship, we can't be indifferent about it or the people in it. They were bought at a price. God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is totally committed to the welfare of his church. And so must we be. Full as it often is of people who can be odd or annoying or so different from us but each one is precious and worth our hard work and our tears. Let's pray that these strange times make us care more for our fellowship and strengthen our commitment to each other and to welcoming new people in when finally we can be together again. 
painful goodbyes, not being able to be with people, to see their faces. These are some of the hardest things of this time. This applies across all our relationships, as well as at church. We don't know how this forced time apart will impact on our fellowship, but may we be like Paul, working to teach well and lead well and care deeply, but always remembering that the church is God's, precious and bought at the cost of Jesus' life, and the Holy Spirit will make sure it is looked after. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for our fellowship of St Nick's, for our life together. We pray that you would teach us, that you would lead us. We pray that you would work in us, that we care for the fellowship that you bought at such a price. And Lord, we thank you for all that Jesus has done. Lord, lead us on, be with us at this time and grow our fellowship. Build your church, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.